Well, I'm doing a two-part series starting today. The wow factor, forgive me for the terrible graphic, I had to make it myself. The wow factor, ordinary is invisible, wow stands out. I know there's a lot of words there, but hopefully when we're all done, if you remember just that, then you'll remember that plus a couple of scriptures. Um, but But I wanna say that the wow factor, have you heard of the wow factor before? No, no, you've never heard of this before. Okay, cool. So this is a, this is a business concept. So if you if you own a business, you've probably read uh, Seth Godin wrote a book called The Purple Cow, and he talks all about you know obviously a purple cow stands out, don't you think? Or a pink Cadillac, right? It's like whoa, what was that going down the road? A pink Cadillac, wow! It's not like all the other Cadillacs. It stands out, right? And so uh, the wow factor though is defined as this: a set of properties belonging to an object that, listen, pleasantly surprise the watcher. Pleasantly surprise the watcher. So there are some companies, some people who have really figured this out. The, the wow factor. Um, trying to think. I was in uh, Wendy's in, in Stanton this, yesterday. Went to Wendy's, my low-carb diet, so I got the Wendy's without the bun. You're on a low-carb diet, it's great. They give it to you with all the lettuce and everything. Only time, yeah, yeah, so it's great, but, the, but then the mustard's on the top too, so you gotta kind of flip the lettuce sometimes. It's really delicious. I was, it just reminded me when Emily and I got in a fight one time, we first started, uh, got married, first started marriage, and she got mad at me, and she, she was packing my lunch for, she packed my lunch. Wasn't that nice of her? Um, but with an attitude, and she made me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and flipped it inside out. So the jelly and the peanut butter was all on the outside of the bag. I had to scrape it with my finger. It was just the worst thing ever. That was the day also when I got home. Two days later, I found out that she had scrubbed the toilet bowl with my toothbrush and set it back in the thing and the oven. And yeah, so tell you what, man, husbands, the rule is don't make your wife mad. She has so much power over you. You have no idea. Uh, But this guy was in Wendy's. This guy, Steven. Steve, how many of you go to Wendy's in Stanton? In Stanton, Okay. Look for the guy, Stephen. This guy walked in. His energy was like, woo. She's like, how's it going, everybody? He's standing back there. I'm like, are they paying him just to stand there and smile and make everyone happy? And uh, he, of course, he gave me a free water. He said, you're low carbonate, man. Here's a free bottle of water. I was like, man, that's nice of you. I was really nice of you. I was like, I literally want to go back to Wendy's every day because I was wowed. I went back and said, what is your name? He said, my name is Stephen. I said, oh, man, Stephen. You just made my experience here so good. Not just here. You made my day, man. You totally made my day, and he did. There are people. Now, I could tell I was making everybody else mad because they wanted me to say that to them, but they were ordinary. They were average. I don't even remember any of them. And if your family works there, I apologize for this if they were on that shift. But you need to go home and tell them to be more like Stephen because Stephen was the purple cow that day. Stephen was the pink Cadillac. Stephen stood out. You guys feeling this so far? Yeah. It's going to be a good series. I hate that I got to squeeze it into two weeks because Easter is like, is like right, right in my back, you know. Um, but uh, Kristen Wallace does a good job with this at her store, Retro and Me. Uh, there's a couple of pictures of her. I was looking for one picture in particular, but I, I, I couldn't find it. But uh, if you notice at the top right there, she, every package she sends out through her Etsy store, they, they put those little stickers. See the little red and green stickers? And they put these, it says, thank you for buying with me. He's got a smiley face on it. And then they write messages all over the boxes and stuff. Thank you so much for shopping with us. Sometimes they wrap them in actual wrapping paper. Have you ever ordered from somewhere and you got a, a gift that came and you were like, wow, man, the packaging. He, oh, man, I should have wore those socks today. I've got the greatest red pair of socks. They are from the company MailChimp, which is, does all of my uh, email my, for my blog. They send me an email that says, free uh, uh, Christmas, uh, a Christmas gift. Said, all you got to do is say, would you like this kind of gift or this kind of gift? And I was like, they, they weren't like, you want socks or this? It was something, you know, I forget what it was. So I checked off something, sent it back. I was like, oh, cool. Get this cool box. I get these socks. It's got a picture of a chimp on the socks. They're the coolest socks ever. If I brought them in here, I probably wouldn't make it out of the building with them because somebody would beat me down and take those socks from me. But do you know how addicted to MailChimp I am right now because of those socks? 
Corey was like, I want socks like that. I got MailChimp. I was like, you got to check your junk bin, man. They sent you the email, but instead you junked them to the junk bin. But I didn't, man. I, was, I gave them the love back, and they sent me those socks. Um, but what I love about that Kristen does a great job in 17. You guys should all go there and check out that shop. It's a great shop downtown. It's, a, it's where the 17 sign is. It's right upstairs, and you should go in there. I get 10% of all the sales for the next two weeks, which is great. <laughs> totally kidding. Um, but uh, there, are, there are companies that just do what they should do, and there are companies that just blow your mind, you know. And, and so, the, but the neat thing is, is that when we talk about the wow factor, it's about uh, pleasantly surprising the watcher. And it is kind of funny because people watching is fun, don't you think? I've seen all kinds of things. Uh, you know, you, you pull up to a traffic light and a guy has got his finger to the second knuckle up in his nose. Come on, guys, right? Um, or you are the guy with your finger to the second knuckle and you look over and you realize somebody's there and you don't know if you pull it out fast or you just hold it there. You know, you're like, hey, how's it going? Um, and if you should strike gold, then what to do with it when somebody's watching? That's bad, too. Um, lots of things we've seen over the years. Um, I, we had a girl living with us, uh, Chrissy Deerking. Uh, many of you remember Chrissy Deerking. She lived with us for a while. We said, you can move in, rent-free. You don't notice anything, not even for groceries, nothing. You can just live here. But you're going to have this, this spare bathroom and there's a window in the shower. We fixed that now with a remodel, and now that window doesn't exist, but the window is in the shower at like, at like in between waist and, and this part area, right? And we said, listen, Chrissy, all you got to do is get a blind or something like that for the, for the window. That's all you got to do. That's your rent for staying here for the rest of your life. We will raise you. Just put something over the window. Well, she didn't do it. Two years passed by. There's nothing over the window. And so many of us have walked out, happened to be looking at the mirror, at the window, boom, there's Chrissy, right? It was just the worst thing ever. So one day we decided we were going to get her back, and we got this mannequin that I had for sermon illustrations, and it was a business lady. She had big eyebrows, very attractive uh, business lady, mannequin dressed in business attire, and uh, it kind of came apart in the middle. And so Emily went out. It was snowing, I remember. She went out, and she got up, and she just held it right up against the window. So it's like right there against the window is this lady looking in, right? And Chrissy was in the shower, and I'll never forget it. Honestly, if, if Monsters, Inc. had done that, it would power the Monster, Inc. factory for 20 years or more. The scream she let out was like a nuclear bomb going off, man. It was unbelievable. Um, but it's amazing the things that you see, you know, the things that you see. I was in the coffee shop this week, uh, and I happened to look right across from me. My screen was like this, and I saw that. Now, I don't know if you can see that, because you don't have to dim the lights or anything, but this guy, and if you guys know him, no offense, I, I would have asked for permission, but I didn't get the idea until he was gone. This guy and his lover had a great time in the coffee shop right in front of me. You know how I got the picture? I pretended I was FaceTiming someone. I was like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, all right, all right. I'll call you later. I'll call you later. So, so I could not focus. I was like, my God, man, seriously. Um, but anyway, oh, to be in love. But... You know, it's, uh, it's easy to say I don't care if anybody's watching me. I'm going to live my life my way, take it or leave it. Have you said that before? Yeah. Somebody has. And I don't want to say this strong. I've said it before, years ago, until God kind of spoke to me and said, Chuck, that's an immature way to live. That's an immature way to live. Here's a verse from Colossians chapter four. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Isn't that a great verse? You know what they're saying? People are watching you. People are listening. 
How many of you ever been like going off on your kids and you realize somebody's watching it? Let me turn this up. Come on, honey. I need you to do. Next time I tell you what to do, I need you to, you know, I need you to. Good little boy. Let's pray about it. Come on, let's pray. I know, I know. Wipe those tears off. Let's pray about it. Come on, right? Come on, I know you've done it. I know I've done it. <laughs> Corey can remember many times um, that happening. Uh, probably more so heaven. Uh, <laughs> just playing. But uh, listen to this. But if you cause these little ones who trusted me to fall into sin, Jesus was saying, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and drown in the depths of the sea. Man, that is so graphic. But he says, people are watching you, and if you do something to cause them to derail, you, you, something to derail them, if you do something that causes someone to make a decision to go away from God, to make a decision, a bad decision that leads their life in the wrong direction, then you'd be better to tie a stone around your neck and, neck and jump in, in, in the water. It, it, it's, he's saying it's very, you have the power to bring life or death to people. That's, I don't say that to condemn anyone. I say that that is an opportunity, man, that is in front of us. We have the opportunity. You know, there are times, I, there are times that I'll, uh, I'll pray in a restaurant and I'll pray a little bit longer because I know someone's watching. Somebody goes, oh, you're just such show. You're so showy. No, it's not somebody goes, oh, look at that guy being all spiritual. I'm praying sometimes just thinking, man, I hope that this prayer touches them. I hope when they're looking at me right now, they think, there's a person praying over their meal. I should pray over my meal. I should go to church. Man, I'd love to have that kind of life. Look at that person and their devotion to God out there. You know what I'm saying? Now, there are a lot of times my family is like, come on, man. Amen. Let's eat. <laughs> right? I'm a little long-winded. I pray for everything. Um, I've gotten better over the years, but you guys know what I'm saying. We're, the, the world is watching us, and it should watch us. We live, they say, as Christians, we live in glass houses. They can see everything. That's crazy living in a glass house. Emily uh, slept. She was coughing the other night. And thank you, Emily. It was so kind of you. The one night out of your 14-cough spree, 14-night cough spree, she went into Corey's room, which is uh, my old office, and she said, I slept in Corey's room. She said, it was really awkward sleeping in there. She said, because she, I'm sure she had the, the lights on, like she, the lights, the television, everything else. So it was probably just like flashes of light. And she, there's no blinds on, the, on that room. She's like, it, I just felt like the neighbors were watching me. She goes, I just feel like I have a telescope. Come on, guys, right? Come on, right? Uh, how many of you feel like your neighbor has a telescope? It's scary, isn't it? You stand in front of the window, you're like, <laughs> all right? I don't care. I just walk through the house. I'm like, go ahead, take your pictures, man. Go ahead. But let me tell you a couple more things, and we'll move into you know, the, the real points that I have for the message. Um, Peter, Peter, in John 21, Jesus said this to Peter. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you, you are, were able to do as you like. You dressed yourself, you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. You know what Jesus was saying to Peter? Immaturity gives you the right over your own life. Maturity gives the rights for your life over to God. When you're younger, dress how you want, go where you go. But when you get older, when you grow up, when you mature, someone else is going to dress you and take you. In other words, his, Peter was going to yield his life more and more to God. He was actually signifying the end of Peter's life right there when Peter was going to be crucified for, for the gospel. And he was saying, are you, are you Peter? He was looking into Peter's future, and he says, Peter, you're going to hit this level where you're going to be completely submitted to me. And you know the story in church history, Peter was actually on his way on his way out of town because he was being persecuted and he actually saw a vision of Jesus going, going back into town and he signified that Jesus was saying, you know, I'm, I'm going back into town to be crucified again. And Peter turned around, went back, he was arrested, he was uh, sentenced and he was crucified. And, you know, that is a high level of maturity. Somebody goes, my God, that's some weird stuff right there. These guys were dying for the gospel. Their death was sealing the gospel for another generation. These guys were martyrs, and precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Now, Paul, the apostle Paul, said this, I'm, even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring Christ to many, or to bring many to Christ. You feeling that? Look at the next verse, uh, on down a couple of verses, he says in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 9, when I'm, when I'm with those who are weak, I share their weaknesses, for I... For I want to bring the weak 
to Christ. Yes, when I'm with the weak, I share their weaknesses. I said this a while back. When you're with people who don't know Christ and they're, and they're, and they're cursing and bleep, 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 don't be that Christian who's like, oh, to wash your mouth out. Well, uh, it's a joke. Emily's washed out a lot of Corey and Heaven's friends' out, mouth out with soap. Joel, did she get yours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was years ago, man, but yeah, uh, she's washed out a lot. Of, I'm talking about the self-righteous Christian. It's like, you know, making you feel, you know, condemned by their righteousness. Paul was saying, when I'm with weak people, I become weak just like them. I come in and I enter where they are. You feeling this? And he says, he says, uh, to bring them to Christ. It doesn't mean that you light one up with them. Um, <laughs> But he says, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in his blessings. I do everything I can. I want to find common ground that I can save someone. To the, even though, he says, even though I'm a, I'm, I'm a free man, I can live however I want. I choose to submit myself to the cross. I choose to live in such a way that other people can be saved. Other people can find freedom in life by watching me, by being a part of my life. Yes? And that's what God wants to do. I don't have a handkerchief this morning, so who knows what's going to happen with the beard here. Okay, yes, I do. Is it there? It's just out of reach. Excuse me. Uh, there is a temptation to blend in, but you were born with a unique something that you were supposed to be a good steward of. Somebody goes, well, I don't want to stand out because... I don't really care to stand out, but there's something in you that you're supposed to be a good steward of. God built you with something, and he wants you to be a good steward of it. I'll talk about it more in a little bit. But John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil. Sickness is in this earth. Accidents happen. Bad people do bad things. Good things happen. Bad things happen to good people. There's your answer to a lot of the problems we see in the world. When mankind fell and the devil entered into the earth and, and got access, legal access over this world, the Bible says he is the prince of the power of the air. He's the God of this world, and he's not doing a good job. And he's destroying people's lives. But Jesus came into the middle of that. He stepped into that fallen world, and he said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. How many of you want abundant life? How many of you are living an abundant life? Yes. You know, God wants to give you abundant life because God wants to make you a blessing. So a lot of people will go, I don't believe in the, any kind of blessing gospel. I don't believe in, you know, I, I just believe. Well, if it's not for you, you know, somebody goes, well, I'm content. Are you? Well, good. But maybe God wants to bless you so that you can give in the vision offering or you can give compassion this year to somebody who needs it. Man, have you ever realized that your talents aren't just for you to get your house paid off? It's for God. God's entrusted you with something so that you can rise and be strong and powerful and have influence because there are people out there counting on you bringing your best to this world. Yes? See, the Bible says no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see, um, for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 5. Um, yeah, I, I believe that if you're a Christian, then you're a walking billboard for Jesus. I, I created this little billboard for you. There it is. If you're a Christian, you're a walking billboard for Jesus. And I know that sounds so, I don't know what that sounds like, but it's true. Everywhere you go, you know, when I gave my life to Christ, there were, there were three people that had influence. There was a lady from the Pregnancy Help Center, which is now Comfort Care Women's Health. There was a man who lived beside of me who wanted to uh, gut his deer in, my, in our shed, in my mother and father in shed that we were living in, um, Dale Michael. And then there was uh, Brother Woodson who had a church right beside of the mission in Stanton. How many of you knew that guy? Big, big guy, man. I mean, seriously, he was a big guy. He was one of the biggest guys I knew. But, the, but I saw him one day going to the Statler Brothers thing, and I saw he had this Statler Brothers thing. It was like the Stanton Park thing. Wow, that was way back. My God, I'm old. People are like, who the Statler Brothers? Uh, but, uh, but anyway, he had this big shirt that said, it all it said was Jesus across it. That's the benefits of being a big guy. He, everybody, I saw it. I was like, dude, that stood out. Uh, it was just like everywhere I was looking, 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 and I was like, 
Wow, the purple cow. That shirt stood out. It's amazing how that thing imprinted into my head and how God used that as an instrument to lead me to Christ. I believe every Christian should turn up the wow factor in your life. Are you ready to do this? If you're a business owner, you should turn up the wow factor in your business. I'm not going to business coach here, but if your business is ordinary and it's not getting the attention of anyone, you've got to reinvent yourself this year. No question about it. But we're going to talk about turning up the wow factor. Today, I want to just present you three reasons why you should do that. If you're writing these down, write them down. Reason number one, here's why you should turn up the wow factor in your life, because, because wow is your heritage. Wow is your heritage. Listen to this. The Bible says, listen to me, all you who hope for deliverance, all you who seek the Lord, consider the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were mined. Think about Abraham. It says, Abraham was only one man when I called him, but when I blessed him, he became a great nation. He's saying, to, he's saying consider the rock that you were chipped off of. You know, you've heard the phrase, you're a, you're a chip off the old block, right? That's where it comes from. That's where that phrase comes from. You're a chip off the old block. God was saying that Abraham was a chip off the old block. I want you to say this right now. I am a chip off the old block. And there's nobody older than God. You are a chip off the old block. You, are, you come from a champion lineage. So exciting. It says Abraham was one, but when I blessed him, he became a great nation. And now, look at this verse in Galatians. And now you belong to Christ. You are the chil true children of Abraham. And now that you belong to Christ, you're the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to who? Come on, guys. God's promise to Abraham is yours because you belong to Christ. Amen. You know what that means? Whatever God did for Abraham, God also wants to do for you because you also are a chip off the old block. Yes. I'm just nobody. Don't, don't ever say you're just nobody. Don't ever down yourself like that. When you gave your life to Christ, God, there was a blood transfusion, and you were changed. You were, I come from bad, a bad bloodline. Uh, that's another thing Cindy's always saying all the time. Because I joke a lot, and I say, man, Emily's probably going to have another husband. She's going to marry for longer than me because her bloodline's got, I mean, Millie, you know, you guys got 100-year-old people in your bloodline. In mine, I mean, we're lucky if we make it to 50, you know? So I'm just like, hey, man, you guys better love me while I'm here because you're going to have lots of regrets, you know? Uh, but Cindy's saying all the time, and Marcy, too, are always setting me straight on that. They're like, you need to stop speaking that over your life. Those determinisms that you brought to the table when you gave your life to Christ were broken. The genetic determinisms you brought to Christ were broken. And I have a new bloodline. I, had a, I have new blood in my, it going through my body right now. So, because I don't know if I believe that physically. Well, I'm not necessarily saying that, like, you know, when I got saved, I went into the hospital and I, got a, uh, I, got a, I had an IV hooked to my arm. And it was, like, from Jesus' blood that they get from somewhere. Some truck drops it off in the middle of nowhere. They, it just shows up every day. I'm not saying anything like that. But I'm saying that genetically we are transformed when we give our lives to Christ. There's a change that starts on the inside and it works its way out. Yes. So exciting when you think about it. And it says, uh, so I wrote, Abraham is your, is your father of faith. You have a spiritual heritage. Why are you aiming so low in life when you come from that? You have royal blood running through your veins. Say that with me. I have royal blood running through my veins. It doesn't matter where you were when you came to Christ. It doesn't matter who you were when you came to Christ. You have received a blood transfusion and you are in the family. The Bible says you have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. So I, I don't understand that. I'm, I'm actually sitting on the front row of the church right now. How can you tell me I'm seated with Christ? Your spiritual position has shifted. You were in the kingdom of darkness. Now you're in the kingdom of light. The Colossians chapter 1 says you have been transformed out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. You were unplugged from a matrix, the world, and you were brought into God's kingdom. You're still living in this earth. You're still walking on a physical world, the middle ground called earth, but there are two kingdoms in it, light and darkness, and you shifted from one kingdom to another kingdom, and you've been seated with Christ in heavenly places. You might look like just an ordinary person, but you have spiritual authority, and you are different from everyone on the face of the earth. I'm not saying arrogance. I'm not saying I'm a Christian. I'm better than everyone. I'm saying you are an upgraded version of a human being when you gave your life to Christ. 
And that man, don't ever forget that. Don't ever let anybody tell you you're nobody because nobody in God's kingdom is nobody. I know that was grammatically wrong, but it sure did feel good. I did it. Editing a book will ruin you for being like fun conversationally. Uh, since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what does that mean? S since you came from a line of champions, run your race. Since you came, Abraham left everything with nothing and became the father of faith. Wow. Moses faced Pharaoh and parted the Red Sea. Wow. Elijah called down fire from heaven and caused a nation to turn back to God. Wow. Gideon was nobody by birth, but, a, but, he, but everything changed when he said yes to God and saved God's people. Wow. Deborah was a leader in Israel when women weren't allowed to lead. Wow. And she delivered her country. Come on, guys. You come from that bloodline. Seriously, think about it. It's only wow that even shows up in the Bible. The Bible's like, now here's the average person who did average things, who was ordinary and did nothing, and we're going to write a whole chapter on them. The Bible is filled. Biblical history and church history and world history remembers those who stood out. Well, that's just not fair. I don't like that. No, it's not the survival of the fittest. It's the survival of the one who decides, or the two, or the ten. Anyone, you have a, you're a free moral agent, you have a free will, you can rise. Don't let the devil tell you you can. Don't let the devil tell you you were born into bad conditions. Anyone can change. Come on, guys. I, I promise you this is true. And this is what I love about Christianity because it offers that as well as anything offers that. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. That, that scriptures like that spoken to Joshua. God was saying to Joshua, Joshua, it's your turn to rise. Why? Because as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. Timothy had the same promise from Paul. Elisha had the same promise from Elijah. And over and over in scripture, we see one generation impacted by the father generation, by the parent generation. You are Wow, because wow is your heritage. Check out this video here. It's kind of funny. It fits. The force is strong in my family. Father has it. Yeah. <coughs> I have it. I didn't know where to do to that. My sister has it. You have that power too. I personally think that was really cheesy when I first heard it, but it is true. And it talks about it talks about this power. And, you know, when you, think about, when you think about this power, this power has existed in the church. It's existed through world, through church history. All the people that are riding over the top of you, people go, oh, Billy Graham, what a great guy. No, not Billy Graham, what a great guy. How about you? Carry that. God is looking for this generation to step up and shoulder the mantle of our forefathers. We need to be like Elisha and grab the mantle of Elijah and stand up and say, if God was with that man, then he's also going to be with this man. Where is the God of Elijah is what he said. And then he stuck out the mantle and he parted the waters. Why? Because he saw the other generation do it. He thought, hey, maybe I could do it. And there are things that have been done in church history that haven't been done in this generation yet, and God is waiting for the force to awaken. I mean, I'm not trying to preach that right now, but I mean, when I watched the force awaken, the first time I watched it, I was like, ah, I don't know. It was okay. It was fair. But then I realized they did exactly what they needed to do. I wanted more force. I wanted more lightsabers. I wanted, you know, I wanted more, you know, picking stuff up with your mind. I wanted all that stuff. But then I realized that that, they, that, that whole thing, Film was about the force awakening. It had been something that had been dormant for so long. I believe that's what's happening in the church in America right now. I believe the force is awakening, and God is going to make many of you. He offers it to all of you that he will raise you up and give you influence like you've never imagined. He is going to turn you from ordinary to wow for the sake of his kingdom, for the sake of his cause. Reason number two, wow, is your destiny. Wow is in your design. It's in your design, 
And the Bible says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and trusted them with money. And while he was gone, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to the abilities, and he left on a trip. You know, in the parable of the talents, there's a couple of things that I noticed. First of all, um, in the parable of talents, you see that God expects big things from you. Because it says that he came back and he said, what did you do with the five talents? What did you do with the two? What did you do with the one? And the one with five doubled it, turned it into 10. The one with uh, two turned it into four. And the one with one buried it in the ground because he thought he didn't have anything to offer. And the master was actually mad at the one with one. He said, take his one and give it to the one with the most. And you go, well, my God, I don't even understand that. What's going on here? Um, but the, the point is, and we, we always look down on the, on the one with one, and we go, oh, gosh, it's, you know, you better do something with your life. But what about looking at it, that, that, what about it looking at it from a positive side, that the, the parable of the talents was, was for you to see that God expects big things for you. This isn't to apply pressure or condemnation, but to give you hope that what God has put in you, he wants you, he, the ability of it to grow inside of you and become something great is more than you've ever imagined. We, T.D. Jakes preached a sermon years ago that became like the seed of many sermons, and he talked about the seed. You know, and he talked about the power of a seed, that you know, a whole forest is in a seed. And what's in you right now is just a seed compared to the forest future God has for your life. And what you start with is not what you're supposed to end with, and God can do infinitely more. There are dreams that you can't even dream for where you're standing right now. There are things God wants to do. You might feel like you're at the end of a stage of life, and you're going out, and you're going down, and things aren't working out. I'm telling you, two years from now, you could be shocked at what God would be doing in your life. God can, God can reposition you. He can move you into something new. In a second, God can give you a quantum leap. Do you believe this? Yes. But you have to believe that there's a seed, and you have to also believe that in this, in this parable, every person at least has something to work with. Everyone at least has something to work with. Everyone has at least one talent. There's no such thing as a no-talent person. Come on, guys. No such thing. This means that you have some seed of greatness in you. Say that with me. I have some seed of greatness in me. I know that's grammatically incorrect as well. You could say A, but I, I think it's more. Some seed. I think you have more than one. I think you've got this degree of greatness within you. And you've got to turn it into something great. This is one of, the, one of the greatest features of Christianity is that God has a purpose for your life. Would you agree with me on this? I mean, yeah, you can go to a Tony Robbins conference. You can go get in conferences and try to get motivated all day long. But I think the, nothing motivates like the Bible does. Nothing motivates like the Bible does for you to rise up and become something better. Christianity is such a powerful force. It's such a positive force. That's why it's referred to as light. You're the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. See this? He's saying you don't hide. I'm putting you on a hill so everyone can see what I'm doing in your life. Do you see how God wants to get a hold of your life and do something awesome so that you can be a spectacle to the world? The apostle Paul said, I was the worst sinner, but God saved me. He did all this work in me so that everyone else can look at me and realize that he can do that in them too. Come on, guys. That's what God is trying to do in your life. Amen? Everyone Jesus got close to Jesus, became a legend. Peter was a, became a fisher of men. Matthew, come follow me. All the disciples, the woman at the well, evangelized her region. Even the demoniac of re, uh, uh, evangelized 10 cities around that graveyard. And Jesus came back, and they're all waiting for him. Why? Because the demoniac, who was a guy, was cutting himself in a graveyard. He would have been a Satan worshiper. He would have been a, a person that we would have just walked right by and said, there's no hope for him. But God had a seed of greatness in that guy. And when God awakened that, you never know six months from now how different a person can be. Don't give up on anyone. Don't try to predict what God can and can't do because you don't know what God can do when he gets into somebody. Amen? Amen. All right, man. The final one, the final reason is wow is your legacy. Wow is your legacy. Wow is your heritage. Wow is your destiny. Wow is your legacy. When your life is over... How would you like to be remembered? People look back over your life. They will put together the times that stood out. Nothing that you do average is going to stand out to them. They go, oh, there was this one time. Oh, there was this one. Let me tell you about this one, this one time. Or they'll go, you know, one thing, my father-in-law, when he gave his life to Christ, he became one of the greatest Christians. He never preached a sermon. So you don't have to be a loud mouth to be remembered. He was actually the quietest guy in the room. But 
but he would wait his turn. I, one of the things I always watch about my father, he wait his turn. There's a couple things I noticed. Uh, one is my kids would come running into him. They'd climb all up over the top, destroy his head. Now, they won't remember. I'm always like, get off my hair, man. Come on, what are you trying to do here? Uh, I want to be more like my father-in-law, but the kids, the dogs would run and get up on his shoulders and sit there. It was like he was a jungle gym, man. People were on him all the time, and he just, he just kind of took it. He just kind of smiled. He kind of, he, he, the, the dog would come and he goes, that's my girl, that's my, he just was, he was that kind, the easygoing kind of guy, but it was so much that it was wow. When I look back over his life, I go, Wow, that man was so extraordinary. Not just that about his faith. He'd wait his turn. He wasn't like me. I don't wait my turn. He, he was I'm trying to do it more, but it's, I'm just tr trying. It's, I probably won't get to 10% by the time my life is over. I'm doing my best. But I will say, my father-in-law, he'd wait his turn. Finally, when everybody else is done, he'd go, uh, Chuck, hey, come here. I want to tell you something. And I'd come over there and he'd go, oh, I was reading this in this Kenneth Copeland magazine. I wanted you to read this, read this article here. And I start, he was a man of faith. He loved anything that had to do with faith or the Holy Spirit, you know. And I would read it. Go, what do you think about that? He was deeply spiritual, and you could feel that. I remember my, my father-in-law being a man who, uh, he, he taught me how to fillet a fish. He was a teacher. He was the kind of guy, hey, let me show you how to do that. He was, he would, uh, Emily said that she taught all of you guys how to change the oil in the car, right? Uh, didn't your dad, yeah, taught you all kinds of stuff about a vehicle. So I don't work on her vehicles. Emily does. Um, actually, thank God for Evers tire, man. Amen. Thank God for Evers tire. <laughs> uh, but you think about the, the things that are, that are, wow. You know, wow, that person Wow, man, if you spend 35% of your life watching TV, then you're not going to be remembered as a person who changed the world around you. On, if you want to be wow, man, you got to, you know, uh, fire is going to burn up all your works. And only what you do, only what you do for eternity is going gonna, is gonna to last, is going to echo. And so when we talk about doing wow, not just being wow to, for the sake of wow, but being wow in God's kingdom, man. What have you done for eternity? Now, there's a couple of things that I think about. Um, 100 years after I'm gone. You know, 100 years after I'm gone, I don't want a statue, I don't want, but if anyone brings up my name 100 years from today, I want them to say things like, that guy was, that guy was radical for Christ from the day he gave his life to Christ to the day he died, he never burned out. Like that guy, I don't know how he did it. People came and went. People were on fire and not on fire. But every time they came back, the guy was still there. He was still preaching. He was still encouraging. He was still standing. All the crud that came into his life. He was still, you know, I want people to see me as a person of courage. I want people to see me as a person of faith. I want people to see me as a person of character. You know, a person who loved God, right? A hundred years from today, I want them to see me as a person who helped develop leaders and wanted and raised up and planted churches all over the world and made a difference and brought thousands and thousands of people to Christ, people to Christ, because he just was on fire and he never let the fire go out. I don't know what you want to be remembered for. It doesn't have to be the same as that, but everyone will be remembered for something. And I think about Zinzendorf, who started a prayer meeting in Hernhut, Germany, that lasted for 100 years, 24 hours a day. It was manned by children and adults alike for 100 years. A chain of prayer was not broken because of one man's vision to start a prayer meeting on his property. That's amazing. I think about John Wesley, or uh, John Wesley, the greatest evangelist uh, from the Great First Awakening. Uh, he's the founder of the Methodist Church. In the course of his ministry, John Wesley rose at 4 a.m. He was preaching by 5 a.m. So working men could attend his services. He traveled 225,000 miles, mostly on horseback, preached over 50,000 sermons. That's 1,000 sermons a year for 50 years. Preachers brag today over their couple of hundred member churches and their one sermon a week. Come on, man. There's a man that we're all going to get around when we get to heaven and go, how did you do it? Besides all of that, he wrote 233 books on all sorts of subjects, including some health remedies. Primitive medicine was in use for almost 200 years. 
One of the, and he wrote one of the earliest texts on electricity. He wrote 50 volumes of theology called The Christian Library. I actually own that library. And a complete commentary of the whole Bible. He composed hymns, which live to this day. He left behind him 750 preachers in England, 350 in America, 79,000 Methodists in England, and 57,000 in America. Here is a man who left a legacy. Why are we going to step up and why are we going to turn up the wow factor in our life? Because there's a legacy that's waiting for us. There's a legacy that's waiting for you, your kids and your kids' kids. God wants to send an inheritance two generations deep. or five. How many generations deep can you push it? Come on, guys. I'm done. I can tell you guys are yawning. It's 1138. I'm going to move to my final thoughts. Jonathan Edwards. Let me give you one more example. Jonathan Edwards. You heard about this guy? In the 1700s, Jonathan Edwards was, um, him and his wife started a uh, church and a uh, small congregation. They actually pastored a small congregation. But during the years that followed, he wrote many sermons, prayers, and books, and he influenced the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening. Together, they produced 11 children. You know, that's a pretty good family, right? Who has 11 children these days? Anybody in here have 11 children? That's a lot of, it's too big of a family. <laughs> He's like, I just have a few siblings, and that's enough. <laughs> and they say the same. Um, the effects of, of, Edwards, uh, uh, Edwards, uh, of, of the Edwards' lives is so far-reaching. This is what I want to leave you with today for you to think about when we talk about, wow. Are you ready to step up? Yeah. Yes? Thank you, Hugh. Are you ready to step up? There is a future waiting for you. There is, there is a heritage of wow over the top of you. You're cut from that. There's a destiny of wow that God has created for you to fulfill in your lifetime. And there is a legacy ready to, ready to happen. This is the most mind-blowing biography you will ever hear about. I bet you'll never hear of one this powerful. And I bet you've never heard of it. Listen to this. Of the Edwards 1,400 descendants in 1900, so the 11, the 11, 11 turned into 1,400 by 1,900. It's pretty cool in itself, right? This doesn't happen by accident. Of those 1,400, 100 lawyers and a dean of law school, 80 holders of public office, 66 physicians and a dean of medical school, 65 professors of college and universities, 30 judges, 13 college presidents, three mayors of large cities, three governors of states, three United States senators, one controller of the United States Treasury, and one vice president of the United States. That doesn't happen by accident. Whew. That's a man who lived on purpose. That's a man who left nothing on the field. He, I mean, he left, I'm sorry, he left everything on the field. When he left this earth, he left everything. He gave everything, not just for a year or two years. Anybody can be fired up for a few years, but you're still going to be going 10 years from today, 20 years from today. This kind of message does all kinds of things. It, in, it inspires and motivates people on different levels, but God is calling out to us today. I want everybody to stand this morning. Do you believe radical terrorism can be solved in this generation? Yes. Do you really believe that? Yes. I, had a, I had a dream a couple of weeks ago that I was, this is, I don't think it was me, but I think it was somebody I know or somebody. I had a dream I was receiving a Nobel Peace Prize for like bringing peace to the world. They go, oh, he's the Antichrist. <laughs> uh, you know, you know how people think. <laughs> but hey man, don't judge me because I have dreams, right? I'd love to do something that would bring Muslims and Jews and Christians together. I would love to do something. I'd love to do my part. But so many people go, oh, it's just terrible. It's out of control. The world is ending. Bury your head in the ground. No, I, while the world still exists, I want to do everything I can to solve 
world hunger and division and wars and whatever it might be, education problems we have in America. I heard on politics the other day that America is trailing the entire world in, or in the, the uh, industrialized world in our education system right now. And yet there are so many great teachers and God wants to do something more in our schools, in our colleges. Our colleges are falling into hell, morally just falling into hell right now. And God, the solutions could be right here inside of this building. I can't touch the whole world right now, but I can touch somebody who can touch the world this year, next year, the next year. But, man, we're going to have to step up and bring some wow. Amen? Amen. We're going to have to be like Stephen and Wendy's. We're going to have to step up and bring the wow. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would be with every person here as we, uh, as we finish up and we head out of here. I'm praying, God, in Jesus' name that you would truly inspire this congregation I'm even saying to myself right now, God, I don't want to settle in just being, you know, a regular old pastor. I want to do something else. I feel like we're on the brink of doing something that could change a community. I reject every lie from church leaders that says you just can't reach that many people. One church can only go so far in a community. God, I pray for every church in Augusta County. I would love to see every church grow by 50 or 100% next year. I'd love to see something awesome, God. Not competing. We're not competing. We don't have to compete with one another. It blows my mind how much competition there is. Lord, there are 60-some thousand people unchurched in this county. That's enough. All of us could, could grow and grow and grow and grow for the rest of our tenure. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would move in people's lives. I pray that business ideas and uh, uh, Lord, I pray, right, humanitarian ideas would come into people's hearts. If you see a problem, maybe you're called to solve it. You see a problem in the community, maybe you're, part of, you're supposed to be part of the solution. More than likely you are. And so, God, I'm asking you to give out new dreams today. Amen, everyone? Amen. Give out new dreams today. Give out new dreams. <laughs>